Today in Documentary Studies, we turn to the World Wide Web in Documentary Studies. We begin with giving some history of traditions and overview of what the World Wide Web is. I want to take you to two model websites. I want to talk to you about analyzing the work of others and about doing your own work. George Landau, who's a chief hypertext theorist, reminds us that writers on hypertext trace the concept to a pioneering article by Van of a Bush in a 1945 issue of the Atlantic Monthly that call for a mechanically linked information retrieval machines to help scholars and decision makers faced with what was already becoming an explosion of information. Landau recalls Roland Barth. We've talked about Barth in an earlier essay. And he talks about the term hypertext denoting a text composed of blocks of text and the electronic links that join them. Hypermedia simply extends the notion of the text into hypertext by including visual information, sound animation, and other forms of data. Since hypertext, which links one's passage of verbal discourse to images, maps, diagrams, and sounds as easily to another verbal passage, expands the notion of text beyond the solely verbal, I do not distinguish between hypertext and hypermedia. Hypertext denotes an information medium that links verbal and nonverbal information. In this network, I should use the terms hypermedia and hypertext interchangeably. Electronic links connect lexias external to a work, say commentary on it by another author or parallel or contrasting text, as well as within it, thereby create a text that is experienced as nonlinear or more properly as multilinear or multisequential. Although conventional reading habits apply within each lexia, once one leaves the shadowy bounds of any text, you that new rules and new experiences apply. I think that these new rules, these new experiences, are particularly promising for documentary work. To capture work that has been done by others and to present the work that we ourselves are doing. I've been reading to you from Hypertext, The Convergence of Contemporary Critical Theory and Technology by Landau. I also want to recommend to you two more books. Bolter's book, Writing Space, which is really a good overview of the origin of writing, its psychodynamic properties, really should be read back to back with Walter Ong's Orality and Literacy, The Technologizing of the Word. And Bolter and his co authors Gerson's new work, Remediation, Understanding the New Media. Bolter believes that we should talk about networks of remediation. He tells us that television, film, computer graphics, digital photography, and virtual reality, our culture recognizes and uses all of these technologies as media. The cultural recognition comes not only from the way in which each of the technologies functions in itself, but also the way in which each relates to the other. We offer this simple definition, a medium is that which remediates. It is the orientation of the self to the computer and the way that the self gets reinterpreted by images, sounds, texts, and the computer that concern Bolter in his work remediation. We'll turn again to that concept of remediation and the remediated self at the end of this lecture. I want to give you now two models. One at the Illinois Institute of Technology, a Holocaust study, and the other at Duke, the Indivisible Project. Let's turn to each of these now. The first piece I want to take you to is from the Illinois Institute of Technology. And in that piece, we see the gateway to the Voices of the Holocaust Project. I want to take you through, through some various parts of this project. Um, let me bring you first of all to the biographies. It is here that we find out about the work of David Broder, who was a professor at Illinois Institute of Technology when he traveled to Europe in the 40s lugging one of those enormous first-generation tape recorders we talked about in an earlier lecture around on his back. He recorded 109 interviews totaling 120 hours into a wire tape recorder. A picture of that is given on the bottom. Um, moving from there on this website, we also get to see a number of profiles of people 
who were captured during this study and now their work has been put on the web I like the power of what can be done here with the technology as we look through these. For example, if you wanted to find out who has interviewed the one person advice button, you could click there and find that one person there and more, more information about them. On the other hand, most of the people we see were interviewed by Broder in Paris there. Now, from the profiles, we can look a little bit more deeply around the site into some of the interviews but I'm particularly interested in the one feature interview that's given here where we can look at Nellie Bundy and we can find not only that we have Bundy's interview here but we can also very easily put on a real audio file and we can download from real audio and actually hear the text of Bundy simply by going to real player opening it there letting it buffer up connect it's a rather large file but as we play the file we can see that the text itself here is available and we can compare the tape file to the written out file beginning in French my name is Mrs. Bundy Bundy B-U-N-D-Y And we can hear the interview proceed along through there. As well, there are maps here, and the maps give us location of the camps. Here's Auschwitz Birkenau. A click there would lead us to <clears throat> information about that particular camp. We'll not go there right now. And we can also go to other resources here. And among the other resources that I think students would find most useful for documentary studies is the Voices Visions project that I've noticed here at the University of Michigan in Dearborn. This particular project gives us 150 interviews and it gives us audio of those view of those videos of those rather those um, those studies as well and then we can certainly go back to the project here where we first come in. I very much like the way this site is organized. It provides a sort of enormous amount of information on an enormously sad topic in a, a very compelling way. The second site I want to show you is the Indivisible Project. We've talked about that in other places of the course. Again, I like the, simpli the simplistic way that it's organized here. Here we can learn about the project and the project very clearly states not only what its background is but what the purpose is, the participants of those involved, how certain photographers and interviewers were selected, how the communities were selected, how much autonomy, the idea again of the validity of what's been done here, do the photographers and interviewers have in their work, the accountability back to the general public, how will the public experience indivisible, and does it have a message to impart and what does the documentary project convey also allows us to go back to the project quite easily here if we turn to the gallery and reason I'm showing you this is because I think students would find this enormously appealing this is background to a, pro to a project of nurse midwifery called the doula project I very much like the way the overall text is here if you notice I'm tracing along it very easily to give you a background but following that we can take a look at the photographs and the narration of the photographs alongside of the photographs we can also hear voice clip here and with an Adobe Acrobat reader off of here we can download a transcript of the interview as well and we can move forward and find more photos as we go along again with narration along the bottom of them or along some of them the side of them as we go 
either individuals who are photographed speaking or the, the doulas, the nurse midwives, talking about what it was that they experienced during the photography, what their meaning is of their profession. We can find here, of course, other information about exhibits, about a book that's been produced with the study. But something very important on this site is the resources as well that have been put into it. We can find information about putting documentary to work and about an educator's guide that's given here as well, as well as links to archives where we can find the photographs themselves uh, that are beyond those that are put on the site. Other people who have worked with Documentary Studies Center at Duke as well as other resources that we can find there as well. So I think these point out to two very good projects um, that by the Illinois Institute of Technology Voices of the Holocaust and then as well the Project Indivisible. Let's turn now before we turn to doing your own work of evaluating the work of others. These are general criteria for evaluating any kind of website, both those that you're viewing for somebody else or those that you're creating yourself. And you can see the previous projects we did have easily incorporated this. The focus of the sites are clear. Indeed, the Indivisible project provides for us in some detail what the focus, the aim of the site would be the information's displayed effectively. I showed you in real time how quickly those those not only the parts on the site were loaded but real files as well, sound files, that the site can be navigated easily. There's no chance of anyone getting lost in hyperspace in any of those. That the authors of the site can be contacted on each of those sites. There was information for postings that it contributed more fully to our understanding of the concept of interest in one place recounting the Holocaust by actually hearing the voice of survivors and another by actually seeing photographs and voice files as well of community projects. I especially like the idea on the Indivisible project that the transcript can be, that can be downloaded as a PDF file. And of course the site contributing to our concept of interest and trying to find out how that does, looking carefully at the way that the sites are designed so that we may easily navigate through them. Now what about doing your own work? Well, we've certainly seen these demands before, that we get a focus, that we develop precise goals for the site, that we perform the literature review on our topic before we begin the study, that we develop a model, a concept of interest, a predictor outcome variable model, and we operationalize the model into the either the interview questions, the tapes that we'll be doing, the photography that we'll be doing, the film that we'll be doing that will later be uploaded and posted to the site, that will have identified the audience beforehand, the audience of web users that will be visiting the site that you'll post your documentary work on. We'll find the purpose of the site and would plan it using text, images, multimedia, and the way that readers can interactively orient themselves backwards and forwards into the site. That you would design the display and navigation and then of course you'd undertake usability testing. The usability testing essentially asking the kind of questions we asked of any evaluating work of, work of others. The focus of the site, the way the information is displayed, the navigation around the site, how can the author of the site be contacted, does the site contribute to our understanding and how does it understand contribute to the understanding, posting the site and then updating the site later. I wonder if the web isn't really something new here. As someone who's watched it develop from nothing into something within my own career and with my own work, I think that the web does offer a way to provide information in ways that simply couldn't be provided before. The <clears throat> Holocaust material by Illinois Institute of Technology, the Indivisible Project, that would have required either a book to store the tapes before this, it would require transcribed tapes. It's those idea of putting those photographs up on the web would have required a book before that. There's something new in this media, something that allows us to do some things that are very interesting as far as providing information. So let's go back to Bolter and his co-author for a minute.
and talk a little bit about a medium is that which remediates that that which reinterprets information for the author for viewers that the popularity of the new media and its impact or really are really something I think quite distinct that the technology refashions the way that we perceive information Bolter writes so many media critics have recognized we do see ourselves today in and through our available media we look at a traditional photograph or a perspective painting we understand ourselves as a reconstituted station point of the artist or the photographer we watch a film or television broadcast we become the changing point of view of the camera it's not to say I suppose as, as Bolter says that our identity is fully determined by the media but that we employ media as vehicles for defining both personal and cultural identity it is in looking at this personal and cultural identity that we begin to understand the impact of the new media what is the impact well I suppose essentially it tries to get us back to something that we looked at in an earlier lecture and that the idea is to bring meaning forward We'll close this lecture with recalling William Carlos Williams' response to something that Robert Cole said in his book, Documentary Work. Dr. Williams was fond of saying, I've got it, or I'm getting it. When viewing a website that, pre that presents documentary work, I think that's the end result, that a viewer, in looking at the website, would understand more about the concept of interest, and the viewer would understand more about herself by looking at the site and by the saying ultimately I've got it or perhaps in many cases more importantly now I'm getting it